Servus Männer, it's Red Pill Germany again. Today I want to talk about a person that is very well known in Germany but might not be that well known outside of Germany. I want to introduce to you the newly elected head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Just in the middle of July she gave a speech in the European Parliament that apparently convinced many of the MEPs so that she actually won the election that shortly followed thereafter. Now in this video today I want to start off where I left things in my last video about the power struggle within the EU now that dealt with the fact that after the European elections also a lot of top jobs in the EU had to be filled such as the head of the European Commission. Then I really want to introduce Ursula von der Leyen a little bit more uh, to you guys. I want to talk first about her family, her ancestors that is, then about her personal life, what she did before she went into politics and then of course her major stages in politics in Germany so far. How she went from being a regional politician in Niedersachsen, Lower Saxony and then made her way up to the federal government. Then closing the circle and analyzing what she said in her speech for example but also what she said very recently I will try to give you an outlook of what her leadership role in the EU could now mean for our continent. So let's recap what happened. So I told you about a month ago that there was this conflict in the European Union of whether or not the leading candidates of the parties that stood for election for the European Parliament should automatically be the candidates for the head of the European Commission or if individual heads of very powerful states in the European Union actually negotiate that uh, privately more or less. There are no strict rules on that of course but in the end the head of the commission has to stand in an election in front of the European Parliament and as you know Ursula von der Leyen was appointed by mainly Merkel and Emmanuel Macron and she succeeded in the European Parliament also. So I told you that Merkel or let's say Germany was actually in favor of this leading candidate system where a rather unknown politician from Bavaria Manfred Weber would have been the leading candidate but Emmanuel Macron for example could never accept that because he said that a head of the European Commission must have been at least a head of a state or a very important minister in a country and uh, Manfred Weber uh, was none of those things of course. So this demand coming from France is actually quite understandable. You want a person for that position that is not just some unimportant backbencher as they say in the UK we say hinterbänkler the same thing so a parliamentarian who is not in the front row but maybe gives the speech every blue moon and sits like in the back of the parliament but who actually was a leader before. So that means leading a big important ministry or a state. I agree with that actually. So in then Angela Merkel said if Manfred Weber the leading candidate of the party that got the most votes in the election will not be head of the commission then all the other leading candidates are off the table and we start anew and that is what they did and they negotiated and Angela Merkel pushed Ursula von der Leyen. Now as Trump fans always say Trump plays 4D chess somebody could say now that Angela Merkel planned this a long time ago and the weakling Manfred Weber was just set up to be the fall guy and to set the stage for Ursula von der Leyen all along but I don't really buy that. Be that as it may it turned out that she sent the head of the Merkel Jugend a certain Paul Zimiak on a secret mission to Poland in order to win the PIS party for Team Ursula. Now if you wonder about the last name of Mr. Zimiak, yes, just like Angela Merkel, he is also ethnically Polish, which makes him of course a top candidate for such an important mission. So it is no surprise of course to say that the values and the ideology that Ursula von der Leyen stands for, more about that later in the course of the video of course, is at odds with the Polish government. So people are speculating now what Germany had to pay for that vote of the Polish conservatives. 
Or also another version is that Poland just wants to be taken seriously as a reliable partner in Europe for a change or also that they are afraid of some sanctions by the EU and they struck a deal actually. They vote for the globalist candidate to get some peace and quiet for once. But that is of course all speculation and only the Polish government will know in the end. In her speech Ursula von der Leyen appealed very very heavily to the Green Green Party for example. More about that later also but the Green Party I think collectively or at least the German Greens collectively did not vote for her. But still in the end it was enough and so she could win this election with a very very slim majority which is actually not so untypical for this position when you look at the historic precedents. Many heads of the European Commission have been elected in the European Parliament with a very slim majority win only. So this seems to be nothing out of the ordinary so far. Alright, so now I really want to move on to the person and the background of Ursula von der Leyen. So she is from a northern German family called Albrecht and she was born in 1958 near Brussels in Belgium actually. And that was not just on a vacation trip, she actually stayed with her family there until 1971. So now people say that she actually comes back to Brussels now as she spent a considerable part of her childhood and her early life in Brussels. She also said that she doesn't feel like a German of course. She first and foremost feels like a European. So if I wanted to be mean now I could say that she is actually not a German because we were told for so many years that where you're born determines uh, who you are and not your ethnic origins actually. So one could say that she is actually from Belgium and then later as a kid migrated to Germany and then later just became a German. But that would take the clown world thing a little bit too far I guess. Of course for people like her this doesn't apply we all know. Her family background is actually really interesting. I will put a lot of sources down below as always. So I cannot of course mention everything but you can do your own research on her family and it is really astonishing what you find there. To give you a short characterization I would say she comes from a typical globalist family. These people are very well connected, they only marry within the established upper class, within the elite. They have actually a lot of very smart, very intelligent, very productive people in their ranks. And nationality of course doesn't play a role in their marriage policy. You can imagine these families like the houses of old, the Wittelsbacher, the Habsburger and the house of Hohenzollern for example. Her family is Lutheran Protestant and you find for example successful and rich industrialists, high-ranking public officers as well as clergy and nobility in her family. One arc of her family goes as far as Charleston, South Carolina for example. Let's just say one of her ancestors owned a plantation there. <laughs> the Albrecht family for example was counted among the Hübsche families and I didn't know what that is. It is something from northern Germany where I know not so much about but in the city of Hanover maybe you know that uh, Georg Friedrich Händel or George Frederick Handel as he is called in the Anglosphere uh, comes or was working for a long time in the city of Hanover but most of his career he spent in London actually and that was because at that time Hanover was actually part of the United Kingdom. So the Hübsche families were kind of the elites, the bourgeois elites of Hanover. So highly educated people, civil servants and I think the name comes from Hübsch means good looking so presentable at court. So staying faithful to that tradition the father of Ursula von der Leyen was actually the governor of the state of Lower Saxony of Niedersachsen. So as I said I don't want to dwell too long on her family history but it is crucial to understand where she is coming from because this is the reason why she she is where she is at the moment. Without this strong wealthy and well-connected family her career cannot be explained because as you will see she is actually not that productive and not that smart. A lot of her family members are sure but she is not one of them. I know some people from families that you could call elite families and while some of them become lazy or just uh, degenerate party people some of them feel a zeal 
a sort of ambition not to let down their ancestry or their family. And this sense that they're standing on the shoulders of titans and their ancestors are looking down on them, maybe judging them, this motivates them to be actually very hard working and to accomplish many great things actually. And then in contrast to that, there are people like Ursula. So what did little Ursel do when she got her Abitur, her high school diploma, so to speak, in the 1970s? She started studying archaeology for a year. Then in 1977, she went over to study business at the University of Göttingen. Then in 1978 she went to the London School of Economics. In 1980 finally she started to study medicine at the Medical University of Hanover. Yes, Hanover, where her daddy is the governor. He was actually governor of Lower Saxony from 1978 until 1990. That is quite a long time. That was not just one term, so you cannot underestimate the amount of influence and leverage he has in that state. So then it took her until 1987, until she finished her studies in medicine. She then went to work in a women's clinic as a medical intern, a Assistenzarzt, we say in German, an assistant doctor. During that time, she worked on her medical doctorate that she actually got in 1991. So before that, she wasn't even a medical doctor. So she basically studied from 1976 until 1991. She studied for 15 years. That is 30 semesters. And I guess the men in my audience know what comes next. Of course, ha, she got pregnant and gave birth to twins in 1994 just three years after she became a medical doctor. Now she already had three kids up until then, so she decided to not work as a doctor anymore. So she is another typical example of the women that study medicine just in order to find a husband or to stroke their own ego, but who never actually have the intention of working in that very demanding field. So they waste the resources of our countries and they take away the limited spots that we have in order to educate and train the future doctors of our countries. This is why Japan, for example, now unapologetically says we want more men to enter the medical field because they actually work in the medical field afterwards also. It is actually quite funny how she is celebrated as a role model for modern women because she was actually having a great career and many children of her own all at the same time. As if she actually had to earn money for her family or as if she had no help at all with raising her kids. People like her have an army of helps and servants around her and her family has so much money that she was never really in need of an actual career as we have seen. So this unrealistic elitist pseudo role model is actually putting more pressure on women to live up to this destructive feminist ideal that women can have it all. They can have a healthy family life and a great career all at the same time. The readers of these women's magazines know of course nothing about the reality in these elite families as they compare to ordinary families. She lived with her family in California, where her husband was working at the Stanford University. He is a medical professor and an entrepreneur and comes from the noble family von der Leyen, which is also a highly elite family of industrialists. They had, for example, the monopoly on silk trade that was protected by the Prussian kings. So you see how this goes. Kings, queens, privileges, monopolies, many factories and plantations. Wealthy, well-connected families with lots of children and a sense of dynasty. These are not normal families. These families have much more to do with states than with normal families. They play a completely different ball game compared to ordinary families. But this is maybe something for another video. Ursula von der Leyen was a member of the CDU party, the formerly conservative party in Germany, since 1990. And when she came back from California, it seems, in 1996, she directly went into a state council on social politics in Lower Saxony. 
Isn't that interesting how smooth and easy all this goes when your daddy was the governor and when your name was Albrecht and is von der Leyen now? Up until then, she just studied stuff. She was a university student of 30 semesters without any accomplishments whatsoever. Now, if you say a medical doctor is an accomplishment, I have something else to add actually to the discussion. In 2015, there was a project called Froniplak Wiki which was actually scanning through dissertations of certain people and they tried to find hints for plagiarism and cheating. This piece of software found that on 27 of 62 pages there are whole pieces of text just copied from sources that are not marked as citations. We call that plagiarism. So it is 43.5% of all the pages that are full of plagiarism. It also turned out that she cited some sources uh, that she claimed say X and in fact the sources said Y. This is also of course a classical case of cheating. Or she didn't even read the sources in the first place. What happened then is interesting. She asked the medical school of Hanover to formally check these accusations. Now, quelle surprise! The Senate ruled that uh, she can keep her degree, of course, and there were some slight oversights in there, of course, but, but the, the core of the work was still solid science, of course. When we all know, of course, that the university could not have decided any other way given her family basically ruled the state for decades and is so rich and so well connected that this would have been the end of all their careers in academia had they ruled differently. Of course, von der Leyen was fully aware of the fact that the university must decide in her favor, so she boldly asked them to settle these issues for her. We say in Germany that people like that, they never fall down the stairs. They always fall up the stairs, if you know what I mean. And this is a principle that would repeat throughout her entire life. It becomes the pattern of her entire existence. She screws up monumentally and then she is promoted or actually rewarded for her screw ups. So if some people still think that we're not living under a feudalistic system anymore, yeah, I think this is now time to wake up finally. Of course we live in a feudalistic system. What do you think? These people are feudal lords, nothing else. Alrighty, coming back to her political career. So with the support of her family, she could rise in Lower Saxony, very surprisingly actually for many absolutely ignorant observers. Her rise was of course planned by her family. She just had to smile and wave and not cause a major scandal. The support, as I said, was so strong that she could even survive the scandal with the plagiarism in her dissertation. Many German politicians, I have to say, actually had to end their careers and step back completely after it was found that they had committed plagiarism in their dissertations. But the protective force field of Albrecht and von der Leyen was protecting her of course. Since 2009 then she was a candidate for the German Bundestag where she lost every time in Hanover to the SPD candidate but she actually came into the parliament over the list. And how she got that high list position is of course a secret. Because way before that, in 2005 already, Angela Merkel actually made her the uh, federal minister for family politics. Then from 2009 till 2013, she was a labor minister. And then finally in 2013, until right now, until 2019, until she became the head of the European Commission, she was, yes, she was actually the Secretary of Defense of Germany. Isn't that laughable? She never even has served in the army and she knows nothing about the military, but she was, of course, the head of the German armed forces. Now, there were times even in the Federal Republic of Germany where public officers still needed to know something about the field they are working in but I think these times are far gone and in the past. Now let me summarize for you what her major accomplishments were in those three fields that she worked in. Now let's start with her first post as the secretary for family politics. Here all of her policies can actually be seen as steps into the direction of uh, making women go to work and pay taxes. And the children in her worldview have to be 
educated by the state. Of course, she wouldn't do that with her own children, I'm sure. But for the serfs, state indoctrination is just good enough. And the more people have to work, the more people will pay taxes. So under her leadership, daycare institutions were heavily funded and incentives were actually offered to families to also use these daycare services. The result is that more and more German families don't even get to see their children anymore and complete strangers are raising them. Isn't that convenient for our overlords? Because God forbid that normal plebs could also have strong family units and a strong sense of belonging and identity and compete with their children. Now that would be horrible, right? So anonymous, cheap, heartless daycare facilities for the plebs, while the elites, of course, built dynasties. The second legacy that she built for herself as a family politician is that under the pretense of protecting the children, she actually tried to have an IT infrastructure implemented in Germany by which the German government can switch off the internet entirely or select pieces of it. Yes, she actually wanted to completely censor the internet just like in China in order to filter out harmful content. Isn't that interesting, especially in the context of the current years, plural? She is absolutely pro-censorship, but her plans ultimately failed as even the victims and the representatives of victims of various crimes against underage people spoke out vehemently against her plans and said that they are dangerous. From that time, she still carries the nickname Zensursula, which is actually a combination of the German word for censorship, Zensur, and her name Ursula. There is not so much to report from her being the secretary for labor, but then comes her longest station, secretary of defense. There is a lot to say about that, but I want to keep it short. As she has no clue about how a military is run and what the important requirements are, she just thought that she could just maybe implement something from her background as a family politician. Her goal was to increase the number of women in the army. So of course we needed then special uniforms for highly pregnant soldiers and also the tanks that were ordered, like the light tank Puma for example, had to fulfill the requirements of a workplace for pregnant women. Now some of you guys might know that the German defense budget is very very low actually the american president donald trump has repeatedly criticized us rightfully so i might add for our budget being too low for nato standards and now imagine that this tiny little budget is also wasted on completely useless stuff so not only do we not pay enough for defense we also spend the money wrong that leads to a situation that our armed forces are so ill-equipped that they couldn't even handle routine operations anymore. There are not enough vehicles and most of them are not in a state that they are fit for duty, but they will not be repaired because we don't have the funds for it. But at least we have uniforms for pregnant ladies who will sit in air-conditioned offices, of course. Another thing that she did is that she relentlessly had everything destroyed within the German military that reminded us of the proud military history of our country. Every statue, every photograph, everything that was older than let's say 1947 had to be destroyed. So she completely annihilated any sense of military tradition within the German army and had a lot of people fired. Not even the most innocent soldier songs are still allowed to be sung in the German military. And if that wasn't enough, there is another scandal. She basically distrusted everybody in the German military administration and in the military. So she brought in a lot of external consultants. Basically Boston Consulting McKinsey kind of people. These people acted within the military administration as quasi-public servants even though they were highly paid 
experts from outside of the military. And she also spent a major part of the military budget on these overpaid external advisors that did nothing in the end. There was also a lot of corruption and illegal practices when it came to ordering supplies and new equipment. The scandal is so severe that there are special hearings about that and people are even discussing to sue her even though she became the head of the European Commission now. So this story is far from over and many people in the German parliament want to hold her accountable for what she did there. All right, so this is a summary or some of the major key positions or policies that she was responsible for as a minister in the federal German government. Now let's look at the role that she might be playing in Europe in the future. If her speech, her address to the European Parliament from half a month ago is any measurement for that, then she will do the following. She said, for example, that she wants to strengthen Frontex, that is the border protection force in Europe. But then, yeah, you have to listen very carefully to a conservative person that sounds very nice. Oh yeah, we have to protect our border. Sure, good woman, good woman, hooray. But what she actually says is that she wants to increase funding and personnel for Frontex so that they can make our border safer. Not safer for us, but safer for the people who illegally want to enter Europe, of course. Ah, you didn't listen. All you heard was protect the borders. Yeah, protect who? With these globalists, you have to listen very carefully. Another thing she said in order to win over the Green Party in the European Parliament, I assume, is that she wants to make Europe as a whole continent carbon dioxide neutral in the near future already. Now, how is that supposed to work? The whole continent of Europe should be carbon dioxide neutral. That means we all have to hold our breath? Or we will not be alive anymore? Is that a threat? I mean, it's not just enough to tear down all the factories and bury our industry once and for all. No, also agriculture and simple mundane things such as breathing will not be possible anymore then. Because human beings aren't carbon neutral. And also 500 million of us are also not really carbon dioxide neutral. So, of course, as I have described before, she will also stand for higher taxes, more immigration and more censorship. And, of course, she already says that people who are against our values are my enemies. What that actually means is that people with actual European values who are actual Europeans are her enemies. And what she calls our values are actually the values of the globalists who are not European and who do not think in terms of what is good for the European people, but just for their own families. And they don't care about the countries in which they reside or their neighbors or the people or their tribes. All they care about is how they can efficiently exploit those people and those resources. Actually, people and resources are one and the same thing for those people. She is actually one of the most unpopular politicians in Germany. So what are the elites doing with her? Of course, we send her to Europe where nobody knows her yet, really. So they can use her for a couple more years before everyone finds out that she can't do anything right and hates her too. All right, so in order to sum up this already quite lengthy talk, I would say that she is not really a politician that has agency or some ambition. She is just a rich trust fund kid that never had to perform or to deliver in her entire life. And her entire life was one big dinner party, basically. Her husband or her daddy or some other associate of the family was always there to solve her problems and make them go away. And yes, she's wonderfully fluent in German, English and French, which is of course good for a representative of Europe. But what she basically is, is a willing enforcer of globalist elites. So she stays absolutely true to her heritage. As I have told you, her ancestors are part of the hübsche families of Hanover. Etymologically, that means they are nice to look at, well-mannered and presentable at court. By birth, she is part of that elite and now with 30,000 European bureaucrats under her leadership, she can relentlessly push the interests of these elite families through in Europe. She can influence the national legislation in every membership country and crack down on independent voices in every member state. 
She can force sanctions on countries that want to be more independent and she can silence voices in the opposition. And I expect nothing else from her. We will see a relentless crackdown on independent journalism and on all real opposition parties in European countries. So let's see if smiling and waving and letting her family or associates of her family take care of all her problems will be enough for the coming future. All I can say is that she is extremely hostile to European people and she will do everything in her power to destroy our sense of European history, tradition and heritage, but especially to further the transformation of nation states to territories that can be populated or depopulated with all sorts of different serfs just at the convenience of our elites in order to optimize the efficiency of the production process there. Make no mistake, for these influential families, European citizens and the European people, but also the people of nearby other regions of the world are nothing else than the involuntary staff of the plantations of her ancestors near Charleston, South Carolina. Be safe wherever you are. Have a great day. Servus, Kameraden.